Information provided in this podcast should not be considered investment advice. Please see our website pretosec.com slash compliance for a complete disclaimer and more information. The podcast live from Pareto's annual ENP conference in London. It is with great pleasure we have the CEO of International Petroleum Company with us today. Mike, welcome to the studio. Great to have you here. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Delighted to, to be here and to, to be part of the conference as well. Uh, also joining is uh, Tom Eric, which uh, all our listeners should uh, know by now. Welcome, Tom Eric. Thank you. So, uh, IPCO, something as rare as a Swedish listed oil company. Uh, obviously, that uh, is due to the fact that you are one of the Lundin uh, companies, the Lundin group owning around 30%. Of your uh, company, and you were spun out, obviously, of from uh, Lundin Petroleum back in uh, back in 2017. Market cap is 1.4 billion dollars, and uh, we discussed a bit before the podcast, uh, Mike, that uh, even though we would like to focus on the future, I think it's important to look back at the history of IPCO to understand what kind of company you have built, and I like to refer to you as a uh, Canadian company. I hope I'm not insulting you because you, you do have operations both in Malaysia and France as well. So please give our listeners a brief run through of what IPCO has done since the spin out from Lundin Petroleum. Yeah, thank you very much, Sebastian. And yeah, really, I guess if we if we look at what IPCO has achieved over these last six six years or so, um, and, and looking back, I think we can be quite proud of where the company stands today. I mean, really, the the, the big idea back then by the, the London family was we, we had a huge business in Norway with, with London Petroleum, and we had some assets and production, good assets generating decent cash flow, but didn't necessarily fit within this huge Norwegian company. And you'll probably recall back in late 2016, we'd just come out the back of an oil price meltdown and the market was in was in a mess so it wasn't certainly wasn't the kind of market environment where you'd want to be selling those assets so we felt we could create the most value for shareholders by spinning those assets out and by putting in place a new focused um, management team and by starting the company which was critical debt free at that time, which most companies weren't, uh, on the back of an oil price meltdown, and then really using that platform as as the base to go out and build a new internationally focused E and P company, and and that's exactly what we've done. We started life with ten thousand barrels a day of production. We had twenty nine million barrels of two P reserves, and largely through a series of acquisitions supplemented by investment in the base business. We've taken production, uh, increased it fivefold. We're now producing f- over 48,000 barrels a day last year. Um, we've increased reserves more than ninefold. So our reserves at the beginning of last year was 270 million barrels. And, and kind of most importantly, we've amassed a huge portfolio of undeveloped oil in excess of 1.4 billion barrels of resource so companies completely transformed the the bulk of those acquisitions as you referred to the first three took us into canada and um, canada's the biggest resource owner and producer behind uh, saudi arabia and venezuela but you know there's uh, a much more favorable political and fiscal environment there and then more recently we did a bit of an acquisition of the last 25 percent of our asset in malaysia that we didn't already operate. So quite a l- big transformation in the last six years. And to cap it off, we generated in excess of $425 million of free cash flow last year. We went net cash positive and we're sitting with close to half a billion dollars of gross cash on the balance sheet. So we're in an amazing position to to take the company to the next level. I want to touch a bit into the acquisitions you have done because obviously one thing is to do an acquisition but uh, if you look at the value you have added from those four acquisitions with Black Pearl adding the most obviously being the biggest but uh, Bertam 25% acquired for free uh, is also quite impressive Ta- take us through maybe starting with Black Pearl uh, being the biggest 
uh, how we have been able to extract so much value from those acquisitions. Yeah, I, th I think the Black Road acquisition was one of those you know, good examples of a, of a real win-win for two separate companies. So at the time, IPC was, um, you know, we were producing 34,000 barrels a day, generating lots of good cash flow. Um, so really significant cash flow, strong balance sheet. And, and at the time, Black Pearl had just gone through the development of two phases of their Onion Lake Thermal project. So their their balance sheet was not as strong as as IPC was at that time. And and I think when you looked at, you know, where Canadian companies were trading and they were really out of favour um, because there was not enough pipeline export capacity, Canadian crude price differentials were very volatile. So it was quite an uncertain time for Black Pearl in that market with with perhaps a little bit too much debt on the balance sheet. So we felt that by putting the financial strength and the international diversification of IPC with Black Pearl, we'd create a much stronger entity and one that would ultimately be able to take um, our Black Rod project forward, which would be far more likely in a larger entity than would have been the case had um, had Black Pearl been a standalone company. So I think it was one of those situations where one plus one definitely made more than two. Um, the the second one, the the twenty five percent for for zero was just right place, right time. Um, we're in the position where we own one hundred percent of the FPSO. That's the host facility for our Bertam field. Um, both the partners who lease that FPSO each year have to have to decide to extend by one year that contract. And when Petronas, our partner, were making that decision in late 2021, all prices were around $50 a barrel. We wanted to drill another well, so they didn't want to follow us and invest in that project, given their break even was higher because they had to pay the FPSO lease rate. So they decided that they didn't want to go forward and we took their interest for free and moved forward and drilled a well and got the production and all prices obviously went north of $100. So right place, right time, probably will never deal like that, never be repeated. <laughs> <laughs> One question on that, Mike. How, how important is it, do you think, uh, as a CEO in the industry, to, to be able and willing to do investments when others are not? Because uh, IPC has clearly not been a call it consensus story. You know, you have gone other places, you invested in Canada, which I'm sure we go back to when the discount was high, things like that, to be willing to do something a little unpopular. Yeah, great question, Tom Eric. I mean that it, that's our, it comes from, if you like, our our heart and soul, which is the the London family, um, you know, knowledge of primary resource markets, um, their entrepreneurial spirit that actually pushes us to seek out those kind of situations and markets where there's a disconnect between the value of an asset where we see that and where it's currently trading. So I think whether you're you know, um, a gold, a copper mine in Latin America, or whether you're an oil and gas producer, um, as, as we are, I think that really stems from the family's long-term vision and commitment and understanding about how you create value in the primary resource space. And, and it's amazing to have a major shareholder that actually encourages us to look for those situations rather than most who try to avoid them. I think it's fair to say that the Lindin family obviously have been constructive on Canada for for some time. You you understood that uh, back in the days. But how important is it to have a shareholder that can actually put on those medium to long term glasses and do those and make sure that you are able to do those accretive deals at a time where the stock market is. Is not there because let's face it, the stock market can be very short sighted at times. And when you did the first acquisition in Canada, there was not many oil companies speaking about Canada, as you say. Yeah, it was absolutely fundamental, and there's been the the backbone of IPC's success to to take that kind of move and to and to move into Canada. And you're absolutely right. I mean, at the time, if you go back to 2017 when we were discussing with Synovus to to buy their conventional oil and gas assets they were one of many um 
companies that were dealing with a, an exit of all the big international companies from Canada. They, Sonovus were selling the assets that we bought because they'd bought all of ConocoPhillips's entire Canadian business and took on too much debt and had to sell quality assets um, to, to, to repay the debt. Shell exited, Marathon exited, um, Equinor exited, um, more recently you've seen Devon exit. So there was a real exodus of international companies and I guess that coincided with the whole shale boom and revelation at let's go home and yeah. and chase the hottest play on the planet and and the, the Landines took the exact opposite view where all the money was chasing the the new hot play and things were overpriced and that if you like that demand for assets disappeared that's exactly the kind of market that we were attracted to and that's what drew us into the company because you had that combination of no will and buyers and you had the local independents who were still suffering with balance sheet stress, having come out of the back of the the late 2015, early 2016 oil price me meltdown. So it was a really, it, it was those combination of factors that we felt this is a great place for us to be coming. But you had to take that long term view, yeah. and you had to take a view that the the volatility in Canadian prices there was going to be a solution in the future and I think that's where the the Londons are great at looking through the the obvious I think what's also impressive is that one thing is obviously the industrial knowledge which is the base for everything everything they do but they they also understand that doing these things within London petroleum would not have been possible so they understood that they had to spin it out to sort of go after the deals in Canada which in hindsight, have proven to be to be uh, very fortunate for the shareholders who have followed you on your journey since then. I want to talk a bit about the market in Canada because our listeners are maybe more familiar with the with the NCS. Obviously, it's a different type of oil, but infrastructure-wise, everything. How? Just give a short top-down uh, overview of the market in Canada for um, to our listeners. Yeah, so I mean, the, the big problem when we went into Canada is it's, its key challenge over recent history has been it's a landlocked country. Yeah. It has one buyer of its oil, which is the is the US, and it has limited export connections to, to the rest of international markets. And of course, if you're then faced with disruptions, whether that, that's pipeline exports that are temporarily out of service to the UK or whether it's US refineries or going through heavy maintenance periods, um, not having enough pipeline export capacity certainly over the last five years has been the biggest problem in Canadian markets. Now, thankfully, since Enbridge's Line 3 came into service in late 2021, um, for the first time in many years, you've now had more than enough pipeline capacity um, to deal with Canadian crude exports. And more importantly, by the end of this year, there's about another 600,000 barrels a day of pipeline export capacity will come into service out of Vancouver, the Trans Mountain pipeline expansion, that for the first time will take Canadian crude to Asian markets. So no longer will Canada be a landlocked country. And what that should lead to is when you're looking at setting the price for Canadian crude and looking at the marginal barrel, it's obviously going to be far more attractive having the optionality to get those barrels to Asian markets. So although it was volatile in the past and that was what drew us to Canada, we did see that things were going to get better and certainly expect that to be the case within the next 12 months or so. Speaking about the price, because uh, you have some hedging in Canada, but you're mostly unhedged, and also in Malaysia and France. What, what's your strategy on, on the hedging? Is that something you evaluate all the time, or do you have a certain long-term strategy on the, on, the, on the hedging? First point, we're extremely bullish on oil prices and benchmark oil prices. So certainly one of the best decisions we made last year was not to hedge the benchmark. Um, that was with $100 oil, that was obviously um, a good decision because a year ago you were looking at in excess of a $10 per barrel cost to carry if you wanted to hedge the 12-month the curve. So, um, And we continue to be extremely bullish. Um, where we've seen the volatility, I talked about the pipeline situation. Um, early last year we saw Canadian differentials come into as tight levels that we've seen for a long time, 13 dollars per barrel so at that point we said let's 
lock in 60% of that risk factor, if you like. So we, we did that, and, and as differentials did widen with the SPR releases in the second half, those hedges turned out to, to be very favourable. Um, we've hedged for this year just the transportation component of the Canadian differential at $10 a barrel. That's in line with historical norms and it's really just a hedge against an unknown transportation outage until Trans Mountain comes into service at the end of this year. So that particular risk factor we've taken off the market, but but no benchmark hedges. And we've got some... More, some of, more of an ish insurance that you're than necessarily a hedge on the oil, oil price. It's more of an insurance to deal with historical risk factors that yeah. should be disappearing by the end of the year, but still giving all of our investors full upside exposure to very, very tight physical markets. And of course, today investors are very focused on the Canadian pricing, and it's been that for a couple of years already. But do you think people will ask the same question two years from now? when you have that additional capacity coming on stream late this year, or, or, or will that be something that is then behind us? I think I think it's certainly, you, you can never say it's going to be 100% behind us because in, in this industry, there's always the unknown that, that comes uh, that, that comes along. But I think when you look at the, the physical infrastructure that turns Canada from a landlocked country yeah. to being an interconnected com country, I think that materially changes the landscape that we haven't had before. So definitely the risk of the unknown happening should be far lower as we move forward. I want to touch touch on to the, the future of, of IPC. Obviously, you have guided for CapEx at approximately $170 million. You are buying back stock uh, quite substantially. That's what you have said is the most uh, value-proposed uh, way to to return cash to shareholders given where you are trading so you, you bought back 12 percent of your stock last year and, and cancelled the shares touching in to black rod which probably is important for the future what is the current status there yeah it's a great question sebastian so i, th I think um as we've been talking publicly for over a year now we've spent the last 12 months um, really getting through our feed studies, so obviously trying to get greater certainty on on the scope of the project, getting ready for execution, um, tightening up the the cost estimates. Um, but I think when you you know when we take a a step back and look at what does Blackrod mean for IPC in the future, I mean our again I'll just re remind the, the listeners our 2P reserves are 270 million barrels at the beginning of last year um, our black rod total reserves 100% owned by IPC is 1.3 billion barrels um, and just the first phase development that we are looking at right now is only the first 220 million barrels of that 1.3 billion barrels of discovered resource that's in the ground um, when we bought the company Black Pearl, um, the previous team had already invested $150 million on land acquisition, on seismic, on drilling appraisal wells, on piloting the reservoir and testing production and getting all the permits in place. So I think we're in a really fortunate position that we've got this project that has got, you know, the, the subsurface is extremely well understood. Um, we're looking at a phase one development of 30,000 barrels a day and IPC last year produced 48,000 barrels a day. Um, so you're talking about significant material growth in production. Uh, you talk about significant increase in reserves. Clearly, you're going to see a huge increase in value and cash flow generation of the company. So it's a, it's a very, very important um, project for us to consider to, to really lift IPC to, to new heights in the in the coming years. 2022, obviously the uh, the year of inflation. How is the how is the availability of manpower, etc., in Canada uh, right now? How do you see that situation? I, th I think Canada's in a much better situation than some of the the bottlenecks that we're seeing. For example, in the in the U.S. shale patch. I mean, I mean ourselves, we had rigs running last year. And investing in all the assets at Onion Thermal and Ferguson and on our Suffield all property. So getting access, for example, to rigs and crews, you're still well below 
um, you know, the rig capacity that the Canadian industry has. So I don't think there's any issues on, certainly on the drilling side and getting access to, 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 to those services. And the EPC contractor that we're working with, um, they could obviously be involved in the in the fabrication and construction, and there there hasn't been a new large scale new development of uh, of a project like Blackrod in Canada in the last seven years. So you're not it's not as if you're in a situation like in Norway where there's been a surge in PDOs approved because of the fiscal changes and a lot of the you know a lot of the service companies are you know have their order books full. I think it's quite. Uh, a different situation in Canada and that's why in that kind of typical London fashion I think getting ahead of the the next wave and showing that we've got a deep inventory in our portfolio and that we're growing into a tight physical market can really differentiate us from a lot of other companies who are just relying on those short cycle step up wells and actually don't have that long-term growth potential, I think that really is going to set IPC aside from the competition and differentiate us. Just touch quickly into Malaysia and France. You will do some infill drilling in Malaysia. What was the status? Um, yeah, so we so we did so that that was that was in last year's program in in the first quarter. We after we took one hundred percent ownership, we very successfully drilled. Um, our A15 well um, that was came on initially producing well in excess of a thousand barrels a day. It's been it's been a great addition. It paid back in less than in less than six months. And I think the big news more recently and where the the biggest value addition that we've seen for our Malaysian business was the approval. We've been talking for more than two years with Petronas, and we were delighted to have received a ten year extension our production sharing contract um, which was due to expire in late 2025 so that means we can continue to produce our Berton field um, beyond 2030 so that was that was a big win-win for both us and for and for Petronas. Tom Eric you asked in the uh, presentation that you held uh, previously for a very well attended uh, audience uh, Mike uh, how about the M&A market in the future because you have been very successful as we have talked about um, in the M&A market what's the current situation there and are you looking at m Canada only or are you opportunistic with regards to other regions yeah, th I think our success has been casting quite a wide net and, and looking at, because obviously different market dynamics change change over time. So we're, you know, we're still taking a pretty international perspective. Um, we've been looking at deals in Canada and, and, and internationally these these last 12 months. Um, we've come very close on, 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 a, on a few, but I think you always have to anchor yourself back to the subsurface and um, when we kind of think about what kind of asset strategically makes sense to bring into IPC today, particularly when we're looking at a, a potential phase one development of black rods, it's quite a narrow set of criteria. So we want something that's oily. Um, we're sitting on close to half a billion dollars of gross cash. And if we're taking on a development project, we'd like to see that cash come back quickly. So we'd like oily assets that are highly developed actually with a much shorter reserve life that we'll see the cash flow come back much more quickly. So we're we're in a kind of feel like a much narrow range of the type of asset that we're looking for that would fit with them um, with the company right now. But like like every capital allocation decision, it has to compete with share buybacks and it has to compete with investing in projects um like Black Rod. We're we're kind of in that fortunate position. We can do M and A as well, um, but really still need to really keep keep that discipline. I think the the recent pullback in oil prices can perhaps help moderate to a certain extent the gap we've seen between uh, the bid and the ask, and perhaps it makes it easier in the short term for for more deals to get done than we've seen this past twelve months. For the M and A market to really get going, is it? easier with a very volatile market or would you rather see a more stable market oh uh, yeah Good maybe a yes or no yeah, uh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well I, no I, I actually the you know i think i think i would prefer a little bit of volatility is actually plays into plays into our favor i mean if you if you look at the decision that we took 12 months ago 
um, when we were actually concerned that interest rates were going to start to to increase and you know there's always a concern that access to capital particularly from the banks could start to get more challenging and then um, you know together with Pareto as our partners you took us to the bond markets and and we raised 300 million dollars and we got pretty decent pricing at seven and a quarter percent and one of the one of the reasons we did that is we didn't need the money we we're going to be going net cash in q1 but it was to give us the financial war chest that when we chat with the bigger majors that we've got the financial wherewithal um to to conclude m a and be a reliable counterparty and i think when you've seen where interest rates have gone and the massive cash flow we're generating now a year on we're almost earning as much interest income as we're now paying in dead interest so we've got that half a billion dollars of war chest it doesn't really cost us anything no, so because obviously with the interest rate rising the net financial cost for you obviously e decreasing e e exactly yeah. so i think i think that was you know that's obviously been a, a really positive thing um for us to do and i think in a volatile market having gone early and raised the capital when we didn't need to do has put us in a far stronger position than perhaps other companies of our size and scale that didn't access the debt capital markets 12 months ago. Do you think, uh, giving that or assuming that you can put some leverage on a potential target as well, especially if that's highly developed oil producing and, and with a strong cash flow, uh, how, how big a deal can you do? Can you do a deal a similar size as IPC today? It's been... Uh, at least from the analyst perspective, quite an interesting story. And it's t today five times as large in terms of production as when you started. So uh, when when do you think you will double it next time? <laughs> well, we can get 60% of the way there with Blackrod phase one. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, But, you know, we, we can definitely do that. I mean, if you, as you, as you rightly refer to, if we're, you know, sitting on close to half a billion dollars of cash and, you know, if we're looking at, say, an acquisition of a billion to a billion and a half, typically you can, you know, you can borrow up to around 50 percent. And, and usually those transactions take, you know, up to six months to complete. So there's the working capital adjustment. So I'd, quite quite comfortably, we could do one to one and a half billion dollar acquisition without having to dilute and raise any equity, given the financial firepower that we have. I think we're uh, going to leave that with the... Uh, with the last words, must be very comforting as a as a shareholder to always have uh, management and obviously the biggest uh, shareholder and backing family doing doing the right things for you. So you can just sit back in and, and relax and uh, and uh, watch uh, um, watch your share price working for you. I think obviously we have covered this company for a long time, Tomeric, and with many of the other companies uh, within the. Lundin group of companies. You can find all research as always on online.pretosec.com. Mike, it's a great pleasure having you here and hear the story of IPC. I know you have a busy day with the one-on-one -on -one meetings. You're a sought-after man at this conference, obviously, and uh, very impressive the work you've done since um, since you were spun out. And we're looking forward to to uh, following you in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you. Tom Eric and thank you for Preto for um, hosting us uh, today. Thank you. Okay. The information provided in this podcast should not be considered professional advice and is not intended to constitute investment advice. Investing and trading in all types of securities involve considerable risk at all times and past performance is not necessarily a guarantee of future performance. Pareto Securities does not accept any form of liability, neither legally nor financially, for any direct or indirect loss or expenses that may arise from the use of information provided in this podcast. Please see our website paretosec.com compliance for more information and full disclaimer.